So I'm gonna talk about the work I've been doing for the past 20 years or so on the neurobiology of social relationships, and I think everybody here knows you know, how important social relationships are for humans, for our species. Um, social relationships can be exhilarating when they are um, going well, but they can also be devastating when they fall apart, and so there's many aspects of social relationships that, um, that you can study. And I don't come at this from a psychological perspective, but I come at it from a more of a neuroscience and biochemistry perspective. I was a biochemistry undergraduate, and uh, my bachelor's degree is in biochemistry, so I became very interested uh, very early in my career in trying to understand the neurobiological basis of innate behaviors um, from a chemical perspective. How are molecules acting in the brain, acting in specific circuits uh, to create innate behaviors? And I also, you know, I grew up on a farm, I always had lot, lots of animals around me, and I was fascinated by the fact that all these different species have different kinds of social personalities or different, you know, sort of innate behaviors. And how does that diversity come about? So I also have an evolutionary perspective. So you'll see all of those different perspectives uh, today. So if you think about human relationships, um, you know, th this illustrates the most powerful relationships that we have. And some of those are evolutionarily very ancient. So we share those with all other mammals. So for example, this mother-infant relationship, you see that kind of bond uh, across all mammalian species. Uh, but humans also have a different kind of relationship. Love is in the title of this symposium. We have uh, this partnership, this pair bond that forms between uh, mates that, that's actually very rare. Only about 5% of mammals, species, um, mate, do the mates form any kind of attachment between, between themselves. Uh, the other 95% of the species, the male and female comes together to mate. After mating, the female is off have her baby by herself. So we're different in that way. So we're coming at this from a you know, uh, perspective to try to understand the mechanisms. It's, you can learn quite a bit about the human brain and neuroscience by putting people in brain in scanners. Uh, but if you really want to get down to the molecules, you've got to have animal models. And I'm going to talk about the animal model uh, that I've been studying. These guys are called prairie voles. And they are different from mice and rats in the sense that they have a family structure that is very similar to ours. First of all, they crave social contact. They really um, are highly motivated to interact with each other. And then a male and a female in the prairie come together. The male courts the female, and if the female likes the male and accepts him, they will mate. And when they mate, there's a transformation that occurs in both of their brains. So from then on, they want to be together. They nest together. They raise their offspring together. The male spends just as much time licking and grooming and caring for the pups as does the female. Um, so again, this is very unusual. Most species don't do that. So um, I was very interested in sort of thinking about how does this evolve, right? You, most species, the ancestral species, they don't form this kind of bond, but suddenly now you have this capacity to form a bond. And I happen to uh, believe that evolution takes neural circuitry and chemicals and systems that already exist for other purposes and retools them for new purposes. So when you create a new behavior, or when a new behavior evolves, you don't need to re or to evolve a whole new circuit. You take a system that's already present and that's, I happen to think that uh, evolution has taken the neural mechanisms that create this mother-infant bond and tweaked them slightly so that you can create now bonds between adults. And I'll talk about why I think that now. And it comes down to this molecule that I think everybody here is familiar with. It's called oxytocin. Oxytocin is the molecule that's responsible for mothers giving birth. It's the induction of labor. It's produced in the hypothalamus, released from the pituitary. And when it's released in a pulsatile manner, causes uterus contractions and giving birth. It's also uh, released when the baby nurses. So uh, breast stimulation due to the baby nursing uh, causes oxytocin neurons to fire, oxytocin is released, and that causes the milk ejection reflex. And what we also know that, that those same molecules, those same cells, oxytocin cells that project down to the pituitary are also projecting throughout the brain and releasing oxytocin into the brain and transforming that mother's behavior so that she wants to be a mother and take care of those babies. And we know that from early work uh, from Court Peterson that showed that if you take virgin female rats, you show them pups, 
they don't like pups. They find that pups are annoying. They squeak, they stink, you know, they just, they will try to bury those pups. And um, if you don't take them out, they might eventually uh, try to kill the pups. Um, but if you, when they, once a female goes through the pregnancy, experiences those hormones of pregnancy, then you will find that a female will actually press a lever to get pups to deliver down a chute, hundreds of pups. So the same stimulus that was once aversive now becomes irresistible. And oxytocin plays a role in that process. Uh, you take a virgin female rat who does not like pups, you inject oxytocin directly into the brain uh, because it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier very easily. Uh, you can uh, cause a female to uh, be motivated to uh, nurture pups that even if they're not her own. Uh, other work done in sheeps uh, show that, um, you know, a sheep, sheep is different from rats. Rats give birth in a nest and all the babies in that nest are hers. Uh, sheep live in um, herds, lots of females giving birth at the same time during the breeding season. So the female not only has to say, oh, lambs are adorable, they have to bond with their specific lamb. And uh, Barry Caverne and Keith Kendrick showed, again, around 1980 or so, that the oxytocin that's released when that female gives birth changes the brain so that changes the way the, the, uh, the brain responds to the pup stimuli and creates a bond between the mother and the baby. So there's the a selective bond that is created by oxytocin when she's given birth. So that's all I'm going to say about maternal behavior now, because I want to talk about this uh, creating, studying this bond in voles. Um, we can test whether animals form a bond or not using this partner preference test. This is the predecessor of the three-chamber uh, test that's used in my studies today. If we can take animals and put them together. We can allow them to mate during this time or prevent them from mating give drugs, we can do optogenetic stimulation, do all kinds of manipulation here. And then we have given this choice test. So here I'm illustrating, just for example, we're testing whether the female is bonded with the male. Uh, the male has a collar around his neck, so he can move around this cage, but he can't go out. We put a novel male on this side, and then we just watch her for three hours and see where she spends her time. And what we find is that if they mate, they will spend more than twice as much time sitting next to the partner than the stranger. Okay, so I have a little video that illustrates this. We can do the same test. This is a male here. Uh, this male spent last night with this female. They successfully mated. Here's a novel female. Um, so we're going to see what he's going to do. Um, most male in other species, the male would prefer the novel female. Animals prefer novelty. So this male in prairie voles, not only do they prefer their partner, they actually develop some aggression towards females that are not there. So you can see how differently he acts towards her than he does towards his partner. So this is a very robust behavioral assay, and we can, we, in the laboratory, we have like a, a 12 of these cages uh, lined on the floor with uh, video cameras and the computer analysis that just quantifies how much time do they sit motionless sitting next to each other. That's called huddling, and um, that's how we determine whether they form bonds or not. And this work was actually started by Sue Carter and Tom Ensel, who, realizing that oxytocin played that role in maternal bonding, they asked whether oxytocin played a role in the bonding between adults, and uh, they did a couple of experiments. One, they took animals and, again, cannulated them so that you could inject oxytocin directly into the brain, and they found that even if they don't mate, they will form a bond. By the way, mating is not essential for forming a bond. They, if they are cohabitated for a longer amount of time, they will form a bond, but mating creates the bond much quicker, or you can give them oxytocin, they will form the bond. And if you block the oxytocin receptor, infusing an antagonist into the brain, let them mate, they will mate, but they will not form a bond. So this is the early work that showed that these molecules play an essential role in the formation of this relationship. And sort of as a graduate student looking for a postdoc, and being interested in diversity and behavior, I was attracted to this system because not all voles are the same. This is basically why I work with the voles, that you have the prairie voles that are highly social and form the bonds, but you have these meadow voles. Same genus, different species, they look almost identical, but these guys are asocial. They're solitary, they prefer to be by themselves, and they also, when they mate, after mating they split, female has her babies, she actually abandons her babies about 10 days after they're born. They're able to survive. So there's something fundamentally different in the, their brain and the way that they form 
attachments. And so I wanted to find out what that was. And this, of course, the first idea is that prairie voles probably have more oxytocin than meadow voles. So we sliced the brain, stained with cells, and we counted the number of cells and projections, and we found there's virtually no difference in the amount of oxytocin in the brain of prairie voles versus meadow voles, or in their projections of those cells. Um, but if you look at receptors, you see something that's really remarkable. So these dark areas, this is called receptor autoradiography, the dark areas are where the receptors are. And here you can see this is the nucleus accumbens, part of the ventral striatum, dopaminergic area. Prairie voles have lots of receptors there. Meadow voles have virtually no receptors there. You also have receptors in, more in the prefrontal cortex than in the, in the meadow voles. And actually, you look throughout the brain, there's various places where they have species differences in the receptors. So it seems that these receptors move around and maybe this is uh, somehow involved in behavior. And we know that if you infuse uh, antagonists directly into either the nucleus accumbens or, th or the prefrontal cortex, so you block those receptors, let the animals mate, they mate just fine, but after mating, they don't form a bond. So this is how we know that these areas are involved in pair bond formation. It may not be the only areas, but we know that these areas are involved in pair bond formation. Um, Interestingly, if you look at marmosets, which are monogamous primates, this is the oxytocin receptors in the nucleus accumbens, very similar to the prairie vole. If you look at rhesus macaques that don't form pair bonds, there's no oxytocin receptors there. Uh, what about people? We, it was kind of a mystery for a long time, but this is some transcriptomics data where they, each one of these dots is an individual, and um, so you can see that the nucleus accumbens is one of the highest expressing places in the, for oxytocin receptor in the human brain as well. So I think that our, our brain is also set up to form these kinds of uh, social attachments. Now, what does oxytocin do? I wanna, if you uh, Google oxytocin, of course, you'll come up with things like the cuddle hormone, the love hormone, even the moral molecules. Some people say it's the moral molecule. Uh, but I wanna sort of emphasize the more fundamental role that oxytocin plays in these larger, more complex things. And, and the first clue came from studies that we did back in 2000 where we took um, oxytocin knockout mice, so we destroyed the oxytocin gene. We also did this for the receptor, destroyed the receptor gene, and asked what's wrong with these guys. So mice don't form bonds, but we could look at other kinds of social behaviors, and we found that, that um, one thing that, um, one robust behavioral phenotype was that they had social amnesia, which means they couldn't remember another mouse that they met before. So you have this paradigm where you expose a mouse to the same mouse over and over and over, Again, first time they meet, they sniff each other, you quantify that, do it over and over and over again, they get bored, they habituate. Um, knockout mice never habituate. So it's as if, I don't know if you've been in this situation, you go to a big conference, you see a lot of people, you see somebody one day, and then the next day you see them again and you don't remember if you saw them again, you know, saw them before or not, right? So this is, this is the phenomenon that these mice have. They can't remember, and they tell each other apart by smell, so we tell each other apart mostly by visual cues. They use smell. And, um, but it's not that they can't smell or they can't learn from smells, because if you take another mouse and you scent them with lemon scent or almond scent, non-social cues, both the wild types and the knockouts can remember. So a non-social cue is something easy to, to distinguish. I think that the social cue is difficult because um, most mice all, they have the same kind of molecules that um, are used to discriminate, but just different amounts. So it's a cognitively very difficult task. For humans, we tell each other apart by looking at each other's faces. We all have basically the same shape, but the minutia differences between each one is what makes us unique. And it turns out, I think that that's what oxytocin does. Oxytocin enhances the salience of social stimuli, makes our brain pay attention to social cues which then we can then uh, use that information uh, for other purposes. And um, there's some nice examples of this coming out um, in studies in mice. This is just one example I like to show that uh, mice acting in the anterior olfactory nucleus, which is a cortical nucleus, that projects to uh, granule cells, which are inhibitory cells in the olfactory bulb. And um, so oxytocin during a social encounter actually increases the lateral inhibition in mitral cells, which effectively takes the noise that's in the olfactory bulb, shuts that noise down so the signal can come through. So in the olfactory bulb, oxytocin is enhancing the signal to noise. And I think it does that at multiple points throughout the brain. 
allow social information to travel through the brain with high integrity. So oxytocin is important in the perception of social stimuli. And if you think about a pair bond, that's what, it plays that role, but other molecules are also important. Dopamine, if you block the dopamine receptor, D2 receptor, in the nucleus of Cummins, the animals will not form a pair bond. Uh, we found that opiates uh, are important. If you block the mute opiate receptor, they don't form pair bonds. So there's a lot of commonalities of, of pair bonding and addiction, actually. Um, so this is my model of um, what I think happens during a pair bond. Uh, let's, let's, let's say that this is an animal, let's, maybe this is a rat uh, that's not monogamous and they mate. Um, when a male rat you know, mates for the first time, he gets some out of sensory information, comes in from the genitals and activates the VTA where dopamine is made and that VTA releases dopamine into this reward system and that's what makes sex rewarding. And we know that sex is rewarding even for a rat because a male rat will press a lever to get a female rat to drop out of the ceiling. And the male rat says, wow, that was good, that was rewarding. Who was I with? I was with a female. She smells like she's, you know, she has extra smell. And he learns from that and he's, uh, he seeks out this circuit activation for the rest of his life. This happens also in prairie voles. Um, but there's a slight difference in the sense that they're also breathing in the odor of the partner, but the oxytocin, which is involved in individual discrimination, is associating the individual that they're with with that reward. Okay, so it's the, now it's not just a female in estrus or a male, it is the individual. So uh, again, this is another way of visualizing that process. Rats, not monogamous, they mate. The brain perception of who, of, of who they're with when this dopamine is being released, uh, they can see it, the, the, it's a female, different from a male, so the brain distinguishes these two. But prairie voles, because they have the high density of oxytocin receptors in the nucleus accumbens that are involved in individual discrimination, they have a higher resolution information about who it is. And so basically I think you know, a pair bond is the linking of the identity of this individual with um, the reward. So uh, I have a paper that should be out in the next week or so, so uh, in Nature Reviews Neuroscience on the neurobiology of pair bonding. I'll show you a couple of figures from that. But basically there's, there's work that shows that in the hippocampus there are engrams for individuals, social engrams. Um, and um, I think that basically a, the pair bond is the result of neuroplasticity that links the neural encoding of the partner's cues with the reward system. And so we can begin to, I, identify that, those mechanisms at a, at a cellular mechanism. Now I want to show you uh, some other studies that gives us some clues about how oxytocin works. By the way, I don't know if I said it, but oxytocin works in the same in males and females, so it's important for pair bonding in both. Uh, we did this experiment where we blocked oxytocin receptors in the brain of males and allowed them to mate, or we had control animals, and we thought we could see differences in brain activation patterns in animals that had the oxytocin receptors blocked or not. Um, and when we did this experiment, uh, we were surprised to see that when the animals mate, there's lots of FOSS activation all over the brain. Um, but we did something that's sort of related to functional connectivity. We looked at how correlated the FOSS activation was across different brain areas of the social salience network in animals that mated with receptors blocked or not. And uh, this is a correlation matrix. These animals were just not mated at all. They were sitting alone, and you can see there's not much correlation. If you let an animal mate, then suddenly there's a high level of coordinated activity across the amygdala, accumbens, PVN, BLA. Um, so lots of coordinated activity. But if you block the oxytocin receptors and let them mate, the behavior is exactly the same but they don't form a pair bond, and the correlated activity goes away. So from this, I sort of conclude that oxytocin is sort of like the grease of the social brain. It allows uh, social information to flow, not only you know, from the olfactory bulb, but to the amygdala, to the hippocampus, to form mem memories, to the nucleus accumbens. And so this is the way oxytocin is work, is helping that flow of information. So, um, I want to talk a little bit about how early life experience affects this system. Uh, we did a study where we um, wanted to see how variation in uh, social attention or 
neglect maybe um, in these pups could affect their ability to form pair bonds later in adulthood. Uh, so what we did was we um, took pups and we um, did this uh, little social isolation experiment where we uh, isolated them for three hours per day. They were put in an incubator so they were warm. They just didn't have social contact, no social touch. Uh, three hours a day for the first two weeks of life. After that two weeks, they were raised normally. When they became adults, at 90 days of age, we tested whether they could form pair bonds or not. And uh, we found that control animals had, could easily form pair bonds, but the animals who had this early life social neglect, um, this was no longer statistically significant. So there was an impairment. But when we looked at the individuals there, we found that some individuals, even if they had this early neglect, could form pair bonds, so they were resilient other ones were susceptible, they could not form pair bonds. So we wanted to see what was different between those that could, where this early experience really messed them up versus they were not. And it turns out, uh, within prairie voles, there's a lot of variation in how much oxytocin receptor is in this nucleus accumbens. Uh, it, here you can see that this animal, is, this is a, two, two prairie voles from our colony. This guy has a lot of receptors, this has few receptors. And it's specific for the nucleus accumbens because if you look in the amygdala and other areas, they're virtually the same. So, um, so this is just individual variation. And we found that the animals with the low receptor density are the ones who were unable to form bonds when they became adults. The animals with the high receptor density were the ones that were resilient. And this, this difference in receptor density has nothing to do with this early separation. They are born with different levels of receptor density. And that different level of receptor density determines how their early life experience is going to affect them. And we believe that this suggests that oxytocin release early in development is help shaping the neural circuitry of social attachment later on. Um, because basically what happens when you, after you put the pups back with the mother, the mom and dad lick the pups and that licking uh, causes oxytocin release. We showed that we can activate oxytocin neurons by mimicking licking. And that oxytocin release when they return has a much bigger impact on these guys than on these guys. Um, and um, I want to, this, this I think is also happening in humans because this is a study done by Ruth, um, Ruth's lab that shows that also in humans sort of interactions um, cause oxytocin release in infants. So uh, she had uh, fathers of, of uh, young babies come into the lab and she gave them either intranasal oxytocin or placebo and then measured salivary oxytocin. And the fathers who got saliva, uh, intranasal oxytocin had higher levels of oxytocin in the saliva. They also engaged with their child more. Um, but when she measured the oxytocin in the saliva of the baby, the babies also had higher levels of oxytocin. So that suggests that that increased engagement by the parent with the child increases oxytocin release in the child. So uh, I'm just going to quickly go over this, but this is a really cool story. So the, the difference between the individuals with the high receptor density and the low receptor density all comes down to a genetic polymorphism in a non-coding region that predicts 80% of the variation of expression. So a genetic polymorphism predicts the level of receptor density and therefore predicts whether they will be able, whether they'll be susceptible or resilient to early life and neglect. Okay, I want to quickly go over uh, an, another study that was where we, um, it's a collaboration with Franz de Waal that is relevant to empathy. So we thought these voles, they lived, they, they have a partner. They, you know, live together in the end of, for the male, from the male's perspective, the female is always pregnant and nursing, and uh, we thought that maybe they would have some behavior, some empathy-related behavior, where if the partner became distressed, they would try to reduce that stress um, and, and console. So we devised this experiment where we took the, the voles and uh, we took the partner out um, and either gave them a shock and a tone, so a stressor, um, or we just separated them for 20 minutes and then we put them back and we observed their behavior when they came back. And what we found is, uh, we can see in this video, um, this animal, the female, was not stressed, 
So the male is going to sniff her and then basically ignore her. And the other one, the female, was uh, stressed out. And you can see uh, how differently uh, the, the male whose female has just experienced the stressor, he spends a lot of time uh, grooming that female. And actually, if you put a, a barrier there so that he can't get to her and measure the court levels, the, the court levels of the male matches the court levels of the female. Okay, So it's a very robust kind of behavior. Meadow voles could care less if their partner is distressed. They don't care. So this is quantification of that. And it turns out they don't only do it to uh, their partners. They do it to their siblings, but they don't do it to a stranger. But they will do it to an unrelated individual that they've lived with for several weeks, so a familiar individual. So this shows you that they can do this behavior towards non-kin. And I think that maybe this is sort of an evolutionary sort of origin of the kind of empathy behavior that we see in, in humans. It's, this is an oxytocin-dependent behavior, because we thought about evolutionarily, you know, mothers are very empathetic. This is, you know, even rat mothers will console a, bit, a pup that's in distress. So if we show that if you block oxytocin receptors, the male will not engage in this kind of behavior. And furthermore, if you block oxytocin receptors in the anterior cingulate cortex, it blocks this. So we did an earlier study showing that FOSS activation, the male's anterior cingulate cortex, becomes active when he sees his partner distressed. And therefore, here we show that if you block the receptors, they don't show this behavior. So this suggests that you know, there's common mechanisms involved in human and animal uh, behaviors. What time, what, how much time do I have? 10 minutes, good. OK, so 15? OK. Um, So now I want to talk about a different kind of behavior that you can study in voles, but not easily in other rodent models, and that is the consequences of social loss. Okay, we know in people that when um, you lose a long-term partner, there's an increase in mortality, increase in cardiovascular disease, decrease in immune function. So a lot of things, bad things can happen when you're losing a, a partner. So being in a healthy relationship is uh, uh, healthy for your mental health as well. So we, we did this experiment in voles where we took animals. First, we did it in males. Put, put two males together, two siblings, so two brothers. They lived together for five days. Or we put a male and a female together and let them live together for five days. And um, then after the five-day period, so these guys mated and they formed pair bonds, and these guys just hung out like brothers. Um, and then we either let them stay together, so they stayed with their partner or their brother, or we separated them from their partner or their brother, and then um, for four days, and then we did behavioral tests that um, people use that uh, are relevant to depressive-like behavior, okay? So um, tests were like the four swim test and the tail suspension test, in the four swim test, you put the animal in a beaker of water, and you quantify how long they struggle versus how long they float. And, and um, if they show passive coping behavior, which means that they just kind of float, it's sort of maybe related to depressive-like behavior. Um, so the, uh, what we found is that this is the amount of floating, so this is depressive-like behavior. If they lost their partner, the animal spent much more time floating, less time struggling. And it's not because they were just isolated, because if they lost their brother, they were just fine. So that means that something sort of transformed in their brain when they pair bonded, such that when they lost their partner, uh, they had this sort of change in coping strategy. It's even more robust here. This is a tail suspension test. Hold them up by their tail. Usually the, the, the vole will try to right themselves up you quantify how much time they just hang. If they lost their partner, they just hang. Um, we um, measured their stress hormone levels and their, their adrenal glands were actually became larger. They weighed more. It was more cortisol, more CRF expression in the brain. And um, turns out if we block CRF receptors, uh, the animals, if they lose their partner, they don't become they don't show this depressive-like behavior. The CRF receptors, CRF2 receptors that we block, 
our own oxytocin neurons. So basically 99% of oxytocin neurons in the PDN have this CRF receptor. If we give the CRF agonist, it shuts down the oxytocin system. We did microdialysis to show that that CRF agonist um, shuts down the oxytocin release. Um, so we did this experiment where we um, either infused into the nucleus accumbens vehicle or oxytocin and then separated from their partner. And we found that if they lost their partner and you got vehicle, they showed this depressive-like behavior. But if you lost the partner and you replaced the partner with this drip of oxytocin into the nucleus accumbens, they were no longer showing this passive coping behavior. Um, if, even if they're with their partner, but you block the oxytocin receptors, they show this depressive like behavior. So to me, this uh, suggests that there's sort of a yin and yang of pair bond. The first story that I told you is the um, sort of the pro-social effect of oxytocin plus dopamine, the forming of the association of the neural encoding of the partner with the reward system, it's sort of the positive aspect of forming the bond. It's like the high in addiction. The second part of the bond is sort of involved in maintenance. So I believe that what we've observed there, this loss of oxytocin that causes the depressive like behavior is very much like what happens when a, a, a drug addict is not, doesn't have their, uh, their drug. Uh, they experience an aversive effect. So the loss of oxytocin, the, you lost the partner, is um, causes an aversive effect, and that's what maintains the bond. So this is why I'm really excited to go home tomorrow to see my wife. I miss my wife. Um, you know, you think about relationships. Uh, um, relationships change over time. So in the beginning, there's a lot more of this first part. And after several years, there's a lot more of the second part. I remember uh, when my wife and I first got married, uh, we, we got a dog at the same time. And so uh, when I would come home from work every day, both my wife and my dog would be so excited to see me when I came home. And now, 14 years later, my dog is still very excited to see me. <laughs> my wife hardly even notices. So um, just a few more slides here. So this is my wife and I 14 years ago when we um, got married. Uh, this is a postdoc, um, Hasa Wallam in the lab, who um, was inspired by the Vol work. And he did a study looking at human couples and measured aspects of their romantic relationships and found that polymorphisms in the oxytocin receptor gene predicted aspects of human uh, romantic relationships, which suggests that the things that we discovered in voles may actually be relevant to humans. Uh, this is my wife uh, today, or a year ago or so. Um, this is a study done in Germany by uh, Rene Herleman's group, where this, in this case they took men and, who were in monogamous relationships and gave them intranasal spray of oxytocin or placebo, and then they showed them photographs of their partner or other women that a bunch of college students rated to be equally attractive or friends, and then they asked the men to rate how attractive the person in the picture was. And they found that the men who got oxytocin rated their partner as being more attractive than when they got placebo. So if under placebo, your wife is a seven, under oxytocin, your wife is a nine. Um, but it, it did not rate other women, they did not rate other women as being more attractive. So it was specific for the partner. So that's consistent with this idea that it's linking the neural encoding of the partner with the reward system. The cool thing is that they did this in an fMRI to see what parts were activated, specifically when they were reviewing the partner and they received oxytocin. They found these two little spots to light up, and these are this is the ventral striate on the nucleus accumbens, basically the same area that I showed in the voles is involved in pair bonding. So um, I think that basically, you know, we can learn a lot about human neurobiology of love and um, pair bonding and behavior by studying animals. And things may be very different in humans. We have a cortex that I'll. Uh, gives us a much richer experience, but I think the underlying neurobiological mechanisms uh, can be very conserved. So I want to talk a little bit about now oxytocin, and, because there's lots of studies with uh, intranasal oxytocin, and they, many studies show that it increases attention to the eyes, right? So 
this is where we get a lot of our social information. Um, um, it enhances face and emotion recognition, attraction to the partner. Now there's other, several studies suggesting that it may have some uh, positive uh, effect on uh, social cognition and autism. Um, and I think that the key to the, all of these effects are that what it's really doing is enhancing the salience of social stimuli and the reinforcing value of social cues. Um, now there's some controversy about intranasal oxytocin about how much actually can get into the brain, uh, whether it can be acting peripherally versus centrally when you give it. Um, the effect sizes are not as, as, as big as you might hope. So um, what we're doing actually is thinking about the future of the oxytocin field going beyond just giving intranasal oxytocin. So for, in all of psychiatry, we do not treat any psychiatric disorder by giving the endogenous molecule. You give SSRIs to change the serotonin system. So um, what we're doing is trying to think about ways of doing the second generation of oxytocin manipulations. And one way to think about that is if you uh, think about the oxytocin neurons, and, and maybe if you know something about the receptors that are on those oxytocin neurons, maybe there are drugs available that can actually hit those receptors and cause endogenous oxytocin release. I mean, wouldn't it be great if you could pharmacologically mimic what happens in the brain when the mother is nursing her baby and cause that oxytocin release? And it turns out there is evidence that melanocortin system, alpha MSH, causes somatodendritic release of oxytocin within the brain, within the hypothalamus, and, but not into the blood. And uh, we've shown that if you take um, a alpha MSH or a melanocortin agonist, MT2, the name of the drug is not that important, but there is a drug that passes the blood-brain barrier that if we give it to voles, we don't have to inject oxytocin into the brain. They don't have to mate. We can give this drug and it induces a pair bond. The important thing is that when we give this drug and then that pair bond is induced by this drug, um, if we separate them for a week, so all the drug is now gone, they, um, they still have the pair bond. That means that the neural connections that were made, the synaptic plasticity that occurred under the influence of this drug are maintained for after the drug is gone. So it's not like you need this drug all, all the time. It's a, maybe a, it's a drug that maybe can enhance learning. If we block the oxytocin receptors, just the drug does not have an effect. If we give the same drug to these little pups when they're separated from their mom, it rescues, it, 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 uh, rescues the phenotype so that they're no longer, as adults, unable to pair bond. So uh, this is, shows you the oxytocin neurons are activated by this drug in these pups. So we can replace that maternal attention with this drug. Just a couple more slides. I think this is really cool. So this drug doesn't cause a dumping of oxytocin into the nucleus accumbens by itself. This drug causes somatodendritic release around in the hypothalamus. It effectively primes those neurons so that they are ready to dump oxytocin under the right circumstances. And if you look at neural activation in, when you give this drug into the brain, in an animal that's just sitting in a cage by itself, you don't get activation of the prefrontal cortex and nucleus accumbens. Okay, it's not activating these reward areas by itself. The drug itself is not doing much. But if you combine it with a 20-minute social interaction, then suddenly this drug causes a robust activation of these reward systems that is totally oxytocin-dependent. If you block the oxytocin receptors, this drug does not activate those areas. So all of this is just to say that I think that there is a future in manipulating the oxytocin system in such a way that it is released at the appropriate time, not just like giving a vitamin, but priming the oxytocin system so that under the right circumstances, so for example, in the case of behavioral therapy, where you can control the social information that's coming in, if this is, let's say, if this is autism, that if you can combine this controlled oxytocin release with this behavioral therapy, that drug may enhance the salience of the social stimuli of the therapist, and you may make the behavioral therapy much more effective. So I'm going to finish there. This work was done by a lot of people over the years and um, funded by National Institute of Mental Health. I'm happy to take questions.
Thank you very much for the talk. Um, besides uh, neurodevelopmental disorders, autism, what other areas of uh, psychopathology do you think are viable for uh, oxytocin, vasopressin treatment? So one is schizophrenia. So the negative symptoms of schizophrenia, they're, they're social cognitive deficits. And uh, basically, yeah, any, you know, maybe even, even depression. So uh, I think that oxytocin or, or drug targeting the oxytocin system may be effective at uh, treating any disorder, the social deficits of any psychiatric disorder. And autism and schizophrenia are the two that come to mind. Okay, great talk. Um, hope I'm not putting a damper on the, um, on the results, but what happens with uh, oxytocin and divorce, both before the divorce and after the divorce? It depends on if you get another partner pretty quickly. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I don't know in, in people, but um, from the vol stuff, you know, basically it, 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 losing the partner causes a... Uh, a drop in oxytocin. The whole, it, it's very difficult to um, interpret human oxytocin studies because you, know, you can either measure it in, in plasma or urine or maybe hair. It's, it, we just haven't quite figured out um, what is the most valid, most valid representation of what's going on in the brain. I, I just, thank you for the talk. I just want to make sure that I understood so the reward system of the oxytocin is not within the oxytocin in itself. It's the dopamine system yes, I that don't is think the reward system. So the oxytocin is really, as you said, the social cognition element. So that would connect us up with the autism, with the social cognition element and, and neuropsychological um, problems of, of, of that part of autism. And it also takes us back to early attachment theory and so on with autism also. Yeah, yeah so I, I don't think that oxytocin itself is rewarding. But oxytocin interacting with dopamine system, and there's some work in mice that also show, suggesting that with interaction with the serotonin system are affecting social reward. Okay, so um, yeah, oxytocin itself is not rewarding. What I see it is doing is really helping through things like, um, like in, in, for example, in the auditory cortex of uh, mothers in rat and mice, um, oxytocin um, affects excitatory inhibitory balance to make the pup calls be more salient, okay? I told you about the olfactory bulb. In that case, um, I think about that as like a television with static, okay? So there's a lot of, there's an image there, but there's a lot of static because neurons are randomly firing. If you turn a dial, you can decrease that noise, the static goes away, and you can clearly see the image. And that sort of metaphor, I think, is happening throughout the brain and helping the, basically the flow of that social information to these rewards, like the hippocampus, where you can form a memory, or to the nucleus accumbens, where you can attach the engram to the reward or whatever. Um, in, have, you, have there been any studies measuring the amount of oxytocin receptors in the human brain, especially in children on the autistic spectrum? Yes. So um, I showed one slide that was sort of uh, just across different brain areas that sh showed that there is oxytocin receptors in the nucleus accumbens. Right. Okay, and then um, uh, there is um, one study that shows, it's a very small sample size, so I, I don't put very much credence in this, but suggests that the, um, there's less oxytocin receptor in the cortex of, uh, in autistic children, but that's like a sample size of three. So. I, I just don't believe that yet. So, um, but I think I worked for many years to try to develop PET ligands so that we could visualize oxytocin receptors in living brains, and uh, we were not successful at doing that. But uh, that's a great question. Also, for sociopaths, maybe are there different levels of oxytocin receptor? Um, I just want to say that I really enjoyed the talk. Thank you. Thank you. Last question. Last question. So. You showed a lot of ev evidence, which is really convincing that regulation of the receptor, both in terms of location and levels, is really driving some of the biological changes. So, so how do you link that to the strategies of pharmacotherapy? If you've got receptor differences, even in your prairie vault colony, you've got major differences in receptors, yeah. which would 
suggest that activating receptors that aren't, aren't there is just not possible. Yeah, so th that's exactly right. So there may be um, individual variation in receptor density, um, which maybe you can determine by genetic polymorphism. So it suggests that ultimately we'll have to, we'll want to adopt a precision medicine approach. So one way, um, like my postdoc, Elsa Arndari is thinking about this, is with autism, it's such a heterogeneous disorder, if you can, you know, um, sort of phenotype those individuals, you know, and maybe group them, um, and then look at genotype um, as well, ox oxytocin receptor genotype, for example, um, you might be able to find individuals that respond. There is evidence that different polymorphisms uh, with intranasal oxytocin affects brain activation in different ways. And that transcription database that I showed you is very cool because um, in there, you know, you have uh, oxytocin receptor levels in all these different brain areas of 100 and something people. You also have genetic polymorphisms. So you can actually find SNPs in there that predict oxytocin receptor expression in the nucleus accumbens of humans. So, you know, we're not there yet. We're still trying to figure out if intranasal oxytocin works itself, but you know, maybe we can get cleaner samples if we start out with more you know, uniform individuals. 